Good afternoon, everybody. The International Parking Mobility Institute is pleased to present today's shop talk, Planning for a Future, Municipalities on On-Street Operations. My name is Justin, and I'll be assisting Scott Petrie in moderating today's shop talk. As a reminder, today's shop talk is being recorded. We will make the recording available online to you and your uh, to use and to share. Before we get started, I wanted to um, Welcome Dave Honorado, IPMI's Board of Directors, to say a few words. Thanks, Justin. Good afternoon and good morning to those on the West Coast. I know we are all focusing on so many issues caused by this pandemic, and there might be a tendency to look at what we have accomplished, what we have to accomplish today, this week, and even by the end of the month. It's somewhat ironic that <clears throat> we all seem to be busier than ever before, even though our revenues are down. It's hard to predict when restrictions will be lifted and people will have the freedom to roam again and return to work. But it's important to plan ahead as many of you probably are. Today's discussion will help you plan and think about future activities. And I'm proud that IPMI is giving us a chance to learn from each other. Also wanna thank my fellow Pennsylvania, Scott, for facilitating today's topic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, I want to go over just a few quick housekeeping rules for today. Um, if you have a webcam and you are comfortable doing so, please turn on your camera. IBMI wants everyone to feel engaged and participate, and we want to see your smiling faces. We want this virtual shop talk just to be like the regular shop talks. Face-to-face um, -face and sharing our ideas. As a reminder, all participants' lines are muted. We invite everyone to participate. To do so, we ask everyone to use the raise your hand feature. For online participants, please click on the participation icon in the Zoom control menu. A separate window will pop up or pop to the right of the screen. The raise your hand option will appear on the bottom of the participants' menu. Once you click the raise your hand, uh, we will recognize you and unmute your line. For phone participants, you can press star nine to raise your hand uh, and press star six to unmute your line. Once recognized, your microphone will be unmuted and allowed to join the conversation. We ask that you please say your name and the organization you work for so that way everyone knows who you are. You may also type your question into the chat. Once the chat icon, uh, click on the chat icon and then type your question and then click send. I will repeat these later. So now I want to welcome Scott to the, um, to the shop talk. Uh, thank you, Justin, Rachel, Dave, and participants today. I thought uh, I'd start with talking about social distancing with a mask, but obviously the goal is to get that mask off and get back to normal. So one of the things I thought we'd talk about was what is, why should we have a playbook and what deep thinking is necessary for planning to return to work. Now, none of us have all the answers. Most organizations are planning for a gradual return to pre-COVID work rules. We believe that the reluctance to utilize public shared services for transportation for workers by others will put immediate strain on our resources. Garages will be full. Streets are already full. We also believe that this reluctance continues at least until citizens feel the same way they do about the coronavirus as they do about the flu. That is that there's a reasonable and adequate treatment. The standards under which we should, we should be measured need to change. Traditionally, parking authority into the parking enforcement industry has been measured by dollars returned, turnover at the curb, dollars returned, uh, turnover at the curb, dollars returned, equal enforcement, dollars returned, efficiencies, and dollars returned. In other words, it's all about how much money we deliver. With the, with the adoption of new standards and protocols, though, we need to be measured by how safe we make our environment and how successful we are at social distancing and public safety and addressing employee health issues. Ineffective, uh, inefficiencies are obviously going to be prevalent. Costs will increase, collections will lag and be more difficult, and revenues are sure and already have de declined, as Dave mentioned.
but we must guard against ultimately a reoccurrence. So to kick this off, I thought I'd provide some uh, statistics, which you can see on the screen with regard to the Philadelphia Parking Authority. A plan was developed in conjunction with the mayor to enforce only certain safety violations, which enabled the PPA to reduce staffing levels and contact by employees with others. Booting was suspended, auction ceased, and ticketing was limited primarily, or towing was limited, I'm sorry, primarily to state police requests. So the results were essentially, as you can see, booting went from over 2,000 a month uh, in 2019 to zero. Towing went from 3,900 per month to 213 per month. The number of PEOs on a typical day went from somewhere around 151 per day to as low as seven. Uh, tickets issued, that's where you see the biggest result. Typically, we're just under 150,000 tickets a month in March, we're down to about 70,000, and April will probably top off no more than 3,000. So now, thinking about it, when given the directive to return, we will need turnover at the curb. On-street garages will be full, so we must have a playbook, in my mind, on how to return to work, how we will protect our employees and the public. That playbook needs to be very granular and identify specifically who is responsible for each new task. Our team's been working on a playbook, which is a currently approximately 50 pages. They've been working on this for about three and a half weeks. It contains new rules and policy changes that we think are necessary because of federal, state, local requirements and the realities of what we're dealing with. And it's interesting, each time we drill down on a topic, we find new things to think about. So publishing a document has enabled us and our team to identify supplies and signage that we need to even begin to implement the playbook. The remaining piece to be developed in that playbook is the campaign to convince employees that it will be safe to return to work. If employees are not confident that we have done our level best to keep their health and safety in mind, and they feel confident that they are not putting their own health in jeopardy, then they will return to work. If we are unsuccessful, we may have massive work shortages. So now the question that we're turning to is how will we inform employees who are no longer on site what we have done, what we intend to do, and how we will protect their health. We think it's a difficult task, and the only resources really available are traditional letters, emails, if people have emails and they read them, and we've set up an automated message system. So with that in mind, I thought we should start a little discussion, and we have a number of cities that wanna give their perspective and input. In the end, learning from each other is going to be critical so that we get through this in a way that is helpful and protective of our employees and our industry's reputation. So Alex, uh, I understand you may want to talk a little bit about what you're doing in Miami. Hi everyone, it's so nice to see some friendly faces. I love it. I know almost just about everybody on this screen. Um, so yeah, um, we in, so since we talked a little bit last week, um, this week, Florida has, and the Dade County opened up the marinas, their parks today. And already the marinas in the county had, at eight o'clock in the morning, there was over a hundred cars in each of the marinas already launching their boats. Um, so it's going to be interesting how that is handled. That caused us, the city itself, city of Miami hasn't opened. Um, so, we already had her rumblings that that was going to happen this week. So what we did was we started our phase in of our employees um, started occurring today. Um, not too many. Um, we're seeing how that is going to work out for us in the next three days. So that if we need more or less, the supervisors are letting us know, hey, we don't have enough people uh, to man uh, the, the, the parking need. 
Um, so that is all to be determined. Uh, we're in such a um, we're in such a, a you always know when there's an event or when you have something going on exactly how many people you need. It's just what we do. But in a case like this, you don't know how many people you are really going to need um, and how safe you feel for your employees to come back. So by the same token, over the weekend, we had to make sure we had all the preventative, you know, uh, uh, equipment for them so they could feel safe coming back. Um, but that touches, it, it, once something opens, you need to think about everybody who that affects. It affects the finance department because we have to do collections. It affects the enforcement officers. It affects the meter techs. It affects, um, it, it's just it, it, our command center because people are calling in with issues. Um, it, it just affects your whole operation. So you need to have a really good phase plan um, so that your employees are also aware that you're gonna be calling them in and, and what you're gonna be giving them um, so that you can, you know, they can feel comfortable. By the same token, like you mentioned, Scott, the city relies on our money at the end of the day. And, and so what does that mean? Do you automatically start giving citations? Do you automatically start charging in, in my case, in Miami, we raised the rates is about $3 an hour. Do you start doing that? Um, and our answer is no. Um, politically, I, I don't even have to talk to the politicians. There's no political will and neither do we want to. We're doing, uh, we're working on a Welcome Back Miami campaign right now, um, where we are going to give like uh, maybe the first hour free and we're working with our mobile um, technology company uh, to, 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 to put something like that in place. Um, so that when the customers, we open back up, which the second they opened up the city of Miami, we are going to start again, gradually starting to charge on street um, and then bring in the enforcement piece little by little. I, we, I, I don't think we're gonna hit them in the gut from the get go, but um, it starts telling people, hey, we're giving you something, which means that now you have to start paying. Um, and, and so we're phasing out, we're doing that marketing campaign. Um, through our social mediums and uh, media, media and and um, through the city um, promoting that we're giving something back. So I think all of us need to take a look at what the city is willing to stomach. Um, and but I do think that the community appreciates it. So I think we need to have a little bit of balance here um, because ultimately you also have a, a fiduciary responsibility for the rest of your you know of the time that you are your budget your budget year. Um, we're doing predictions now and, and we don't know. We're, we're taking a shot in the dark and seeing what our budget's going to look like. Um, so hopefully we can continue these conversations, Scott, and we can know um, what other people are doing and what, as soon as things start beginning to open, I think we all need to start sharing information as to what we're seeing so that you can see what the lag is on the revenues coming in and can prepare better. Um, but that's what we are doing right now as a phased in plan. And, and I'll let you guys know how good or not is going um, in a, about a week or so. Well, we're rooting for you, that's for sure. I'm curious, since you had to experience this a little sooner than the rest of us, uh, did you give thought, and maybe it's not required in your state, to testing employees, uh, you know, the thermometer and how you do that? Did you have to do that, or was that something you didn't have to do? We didn't have to do it. Um, there have been a lot of conversation uh, with us and the city on the thermometer testing and the, the lack of accuracy. Um, yeah. Ultimately, I'll give you a, a, a really small in, 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 in a, a small synopsis of, of our conversation was you're coming out of a cold car, you get out into 95 degree weather, which is in Miami, you come into the cold air, you take your temperature, it, it, it's never going to be accurate. Um, okay. We have a policy of supervisors, if somebody's sick, you know, they, they feel sick, they are sick, you notice that they're sick, they, they need to go home. It's always been a part of our policy, but now it's being enforced. Okay. Um, so, yeah, and, and there is a, and we are talking now about having um, employees sign um, that they are not, you know, that they, 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 got, they got tested, they tested positive, they, they need to, and it's the honor system really, Scott, at this point. Yeah. Sure, sure. And I get that. There are a lot of uh, privacy issues that tie in into that. And that was a real struggle for us. I think we're going to try uh, a testing uh, pro protocol with footprints and, and all kinds of things. But, but we'll see. We, you know, we don't know. Um, how about Alyssa from Denver? We went from we're going to go from a warm climate to a cold climate. What are you doing, Alyssa, in Denver? 
Um, so, hey guys, I was just trying to get myself off mute. You know, I think I got it. Um, so, I think that, you know, in Denver, we have, you know, uh, our, our stay at home order has ended, ended for the state and it has been extended to um, May 8th. And so I think there's actually gonna be a lot, of, a lot of the stuff that we're working on is coming from our public health department and the information that they're providing for us. So our, our system is um, internal and it is something that, it's a city run pro process. And so we are really taking direction from our management and from the folks who know more um, than us about this whole process and how we can kind of be safe about it. Currently we're doing a, since our meters are not on and not operating, we're doing a ton of maintenance on them. And so we've been learning a lot about how long it takes to clean a, a meter. So when our techs are out there, people aren't touching them, the general public, but they are. And so what does that look like from a PPE standpoint? How many gloves do they need to go through every day? How much uh, you know, cleaning solution are they using to, to clean the meter? Um, that sort of thing. So we've been really trying to use this time to make sure that our system is operating at the best of its ability since um, we are actually supposed to be um, out for RFP current right now for new meter technology and that has been pushed for at least another year. So I think we're really trying to figure out um, what to do and how to, how to, how to do it well. Uh, it's been really interesting to also see like what turning meters off looks like for downtown. So most people who are coming down to these paid parking areas are really, I think, going to their office and not parking in the in the parking garages. And so we've had some of our parking operators reach out to us and ask us to please turn on the meters because their business is suffering. Um, and so they want to keep their employees paid and they want to keep people moving forward. Um, so it's been interesting to see that as well. Yeah. Could you follow up a little bit? To you? Maybe you don't have the data in front of you, but roughly how long does it? take to clean a meter that's something we were trying to guesstimate yeah so it's that's a it's super good we actually had some folks who um went out there a couple days ago to use so if you had like a clorox wipe like it takes about a you know a couple of swipes so maybe a minute but we don't have clorox wipes like we don't have we can't get them we can't definitely can't get them at the scale that we'll need and if you have like a spray bottle, if you spray the meter, it takes six, six to eight sprays to spray the meter and then to use paper towel, wipe it off. But if you have a towel and then you are using the towel, spraying the towel and then wiping off, it takes less time and less sprays. So it, I mean, like, this is like, oh my gosh, like stuff, like you're not ever really thought about. So um, it takes at least about 30 seconds to a minute each meter. And that's, you know, kind of significant when you have, we have 6,200 meters. I mean, some of them are definitely more used than others, but yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> and, and have you established a protocol on how often you're going to clean the hardware at the street and what, yeah. you, what you think you should be doing? So I think the protocol so far, and honestly, so since they're not on, we're, we're still working through that. We have a few more, a week or so to figure it out. And I'm not even sure if they will actually turn on on the 8th or 11th or whatever of May. Um, but for sure, anytime you a tech or a collector are out there to um, to touch the meter and clean it, or touch the meter and like do maintenance or collect this meter, we're asking them to clean it. That means it's just gonna take longer for them to do their actual job. Um, and then outside of that, I think we're sure trying to figure it out. I, we just don't have the staff to be able to be out there every single day cleaning every single meter. So um, I think we're trying to figure out what the best protocols are and also understand like, what does it mean? We have a lot of sun in Denver. So if you're on a block that has high amounts of sun, does the virus die sooner? Like it, there's still so much information that we don't have that we don't know. And so we're also looking for guidance for that. So if anyone has any knowledge or thoughts on that one, I'd be interested to hear. Sure. Sure. That well, that's the whole purpose of this shop talk to uh, to share experiences and and think about it. I thought I'd follow up with one thing. What about cars and vehicles? Have you come up with a protocol for the cleaning of cars that your employees drive in or operate? Yeah, that's a great question, and I, I think you know we're looking to for guidance so that it's not specific to us since we are part of the city and are part of our Department of Transportation and Infrastructure. So what the guidance is for everybody. So there's a lot of teams that are out on the street currently replacing signs, you know, working on, um, you know, signals and all that kind of thing. So I think we're looking for them to give us a little bit more information. Um, I also think it's a lot about what we can get our hands on. So how much PPE, how much cleaning supplies can we actually get? Sure. Yeah. yeah, if you can't get the supplies and then who inventories it and make sure 
that it's ordered? Is that procurement? But then who distributes it? Is that distribution or, and how does the product get out to the employees, especially if you're at multiple sites? I think those are all excellent points you bring up. Well, let's switch farther west and hey, talk to uh, Scott? Benito. Yes. Scott, real quickly, there's just a few questions that came up that Perfect. might be relevant okay. um, in the chat here. Perfect. Um, the first question is um, from Cynthia. Um, should the employer provide testing to the employees? Yeah, so that's, that's kind of an interesting question, right? Um, we're going to do it. Um, we have not yet talked to the union about it or the unions. So we don't know what their reaction is going to be. But in order to build that level of confidence when people return, uh, we're going, we've set up a protocol uh, with multiple locations. And it creates all kinds of issues if you decide to do it, because then you have to um, watch the numbers of people. And if you're bringing people in that you think might be unhealthy, you have a duty to clean between shifts. So it's really created when we're trying to move a thousand employees into our facilities in one day, it becomes a monstrous challenge. But the real question that, uh, that the uh, person asked is, you know, should you, or maybe the answer is, can you? I think you can, but uh, it, it's gonna create all kinds of HIPAA issues and uh, obviously operational issues to try and bring and move employees through. I mean, I don't know if anybody else has an answer. I'm not saying I'm right. Um, T. Smith posted probably to the follow-up to this one is that um, that it's a false sense of security. Uh, according to the CDC, you should have COVID and you could have COVID and not have a temperature. Very true. That is absolutely true. And in fact, we've seen with employees uh, who were tested and ultimately were positive that the first couple tests even the sophisticated early tests uh, gave false readings and they found out five, 10, 15 days later that they were in fact uh, sick. So they presented with symptoms. So it is a, it is a false positive or a false sense of security to, to many employees. Yeah. yeah, or it could be anyway. Um, in one conversation I had with a union rep about one particular issue, I had, they thought that it was like an adverse situation. And I finally said, look, here's the bottom line in protecting our employees. I don't want to be on a ventilator. And then he laughed and he said, yeah, you're right. You're being honest with me. It's like, yeah, of course I'm being honest. <laughs> but it had, to be, it had to be phrased in a way that, yeah, I don't want to get sick either. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, how about if we go out west, Benita? Uh, from Washington, or actually Washington, D.C. It's not out west, it's out east. Uh, what's going on in Washington, D.C., the capital of all capitals? Uh, let's see. Hopefully you all can see me. Hi, everybody. Hi. Um, out here in D.C., and I know some of my colleagues are on the call. Um, so from a meter operation perspective, we we're, we're still have our meters on, and we were actually just running the numbers this morning. We've... Uh, when I talked to some folks last month, we saw a 48% drop in March. Uh, we are now, like our peers, now at 88, 90% down in revenue. Our meters are still on. Uh, we are not doing a cleaning procedure just because the reality is we may clean it and then five minutes later it may be compromised. So the guidance has been for the public to self-sanitize if they're gonna use the meters. Uh, we are still having a conversation trying to uh, push um, some marketing outreach about encouraging pay by sell. I know there's some folks like, why can't you encourage that? Uh, that's something we are having conversations. Hopefully we'll push out soon. However, there is the, the fine line of how do you deal with those that are unbanked, uh, don't have a cell phone. It's rare and rare each day, even here in the district, but we still have to be very sensitive to that population as well. Uh, so we have that. Uh, my colleague, uh, and I'll give a shout out to him because I know he's on the call, D'Angelo Baines, and our, the rest of our team has been facilitating, uh, shutting down some of our metered spaces to facilitate uh, temporary pickup drop-off zones for our restaurant, uh, restaurant zones, our, rest, our restaurants in the district. Right now, I think uh, we've uh, 
um, uh, reprogrammed between 400 and 500 parking spaces all across the district to facilitate uh, this access. And uh, this stemmed from an idea that came out of Seattle. So uh, tip of the hat to Mike and the Seattle team for uh, getting that conversation going. Um, but I think the other conversation since the topic is where do we go from here? Uh, our team is actively having that conversation. We were actually having a conversation pre-COVID, but now it, it highlights the issue even more now of we feel that going into the future, there's going to be more demand for that uh, curbside touch versus vehicle storage. So pick up, drop off, uh, whether it's for a passenger, whether it's for goods and delivery, I think that that's going to, uh, I don't see that dropping anytime soon. If anything, it may be a very slow to a, a new plateau for these uh, Uber Eats or your uh, shipped or uh, whatever grocery delivery. So the question for us is we need to think about how are we going to recapture the value of the curb because there's still there's still going to be demand on that curb uh, to access it to pick up drop off people and goods. Um, and we need to find some way to manage it. So how, um, you can do time limits, but reality for parking enforcement, there's no way to you know time someone for three minutes. It's just not going to happen, uh, especially all across the city. And you're talking about 20,000 meter spaces here in DC. Uh, but can we regulate through price? Uh, and I think there was some initial uh, approach out of Chicago and we're trying to uh, figure out how do we do that here? Uh, you, know, our interp you know, again, it's still a rough idea, uh, but you know, do we do a, um, a mobility access fee you know, using the transportation network? Uh, and, and also in our mindset here in DC is also the, the gas tax, you know, what's going to replace the gas tax for us. You know? um, so a mobility access fee to use the transportation network, as well as a curbside access fee. Uh, and then, you know, how do you, in trying to develop the tools uh, on to, to allow us to be a little more dynamic, you know, to account for time of day, you know, peak off peak, uh, deal with areas that are near public transportation versus areas that are uh, Tra uh, public transportation deserts. Uh, so we also try to be very cognizant and sensitive to um, environmental justice populations. So I'll stop there for a moment to uh, let the team catch up. <laughs> yeah, no, you're dealing with a lot of really high level issues about, about uh, things we should all be thinking about. Um, so I don't know if anybody has any questions that popped up. Um, there were lots of things flying across the screen. I couldn't even follow them all, but the people were taking notes. Well, uh, Benita, we may come back to you uh, in a moment. We'll see. Uh, David Bray, what's uh, Virginia Beach on uh, about these days? I don't know if David's on, but we're going to try and find him. David, you're unmuted. Go. Uh, I would call on somebody else because he's okay. unmuted, but he's looks like he may have stepped away. Yeah, he may have gotten a call. Hey, I'm here. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. we can hear you. Okay, I'm sorry about that. That's okay. Um, so Virginia Beach, we're we're uh, we're in a challenging time. Uh, we have uh, our resort area, and our season was supposed to start, you know, uh, April one. Um, you know, with that, you know, there were the uh, restrictions put in place before the start of the season. So the biggest start was that. Uh, we weren't able to staff appropriately, um, and then after that, uh, we caught a lot of kickback from the public, from the people that were down here with our meters on, and just giving out warnings was very offensive to them. How dare us, you know, try to enforce paid parking, and, you know, down here. <laughs> um, so we adjusted, and uh, our approach now has been more of you know, uh, an ambassador approach where we are just out there amongst the public. You know, we, of course, have PPE uh, equipment uh, for our staff, and we're just informing people, you know, hey, look, the season is here. You know, the meters are on. We are charging. Um, we're not going to do anything to enforce it. There's no penalty for you, but uh, you should really be paying the meter. <laughs> so, um, you know, and then we have our second area that we enforce also, uh, our downtown town center area, where we've uh, went ahead and suspended all overstays 
uh, for okay. our time restricted on street parking. Uh, we focus more now on assisting and facilitating uh, pickup for Grubhub and other um, uh, ways, uh, other um, you know, uh, people that are doing pickup service with the uh, restaurants that are right there in that small area. How about so, that? Yes. Uh, it, it, it's been a uh, it's it's been a month of change and uh, a lot of reflection, a lot of data collection that we've been doing as well. So I know uh, one of our operations uh, people, uh, folks, Karina O'Connor, just uh, sent over a question. I don't know if uh, you you want to read it or you want to put her on, but she has a question for you, uh, David. Okay, yeah, I see it. Uh, do we only enforce some areas on a seasonal basis? Well, in Virginia Beach. We have the two areas that we enforce. We have the resort area, which includes the beach, um, and then the residential area right behind the resort. Uh, and that is only enforced right now from April 1 to October 31st. Uh, and then our downtown town center area is enforced uh, year round. Yeah. So I think your conversation brings up uh, something we're struggling with, and I'm curious if others are. Uh, when we made an announcement that we were going to limited enforcement, which we had defined in a press conference uh, at, with alongside the mayor as being safety, within days people just first interpreted that we weren't enforcing at all and that were, they were offended when uh, they got a ticket even if they parked in front of a fire hydrant. Uh, right. Yeah. And then uh, we're now in that phase that you're kind of describing where people have not paid for so long at the meters they're on, but most people know not to pay, I think. And now the public that has been um, quarantined in their home have decided that that's their space. So to the point that even though our off street is free uh, and that we're particularly honoring healthcare workers, healthcare mm -hmm. workers sometimes want to, instead of parking the free garage, if it's full, they'll park in a passenger loading zone for a hospital and then call and complain when they get a ticket because they block right. the ability of somebody to get. So how do you deal with that? Um, what, what's what been your methodology to uh, stem that public sentiment that is unhappy with anything you do? More or less a sense of, a sense of entitlement. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, with our downtown area, we are still enforcing safety violations, okay. uh, parking in front of fire hydrants, uh, blocking crosswalks and sidewalks, uh, violations of those nature. Um, down here at the resort area, we're not having that much of a parking demand where those are really becoming issues at the moment. Okay. Um, and if we do come across them, uh, they're usually not too far from where they're parked that we can you know, approach them and let them know that they do have to move. Okay, very good. Well, let's switch all the way to the West Coast and find out what they're doing. John, from Portland, what, what's going on in Portland? I want to come visit. Actually, it's Portland, yeah, Maine. Yeah, it's Portland, Maine. That's where we're yeah, from. Yeah. I w I'm having trouble with my eyesight these days. The, uh, I didn't see the Maine. I thought it was uh, the other Portland. Anyway, what's going on in Maine? Well, pretty much the same as everybody else. We suspended uh, enforcement of parking meters and time zones both the middle of March. Uh, we're getting ready to gear back up. We're probably going to be going this way until about the end of May. I was just talked with the city manager. And he anticipates things opening back up by the 1st of June. Our garages are remaining open. We still have some customers going in. Uh, we tried to close one of them. We got a lot of pushback from a couple of employees who said they were essential employees and they couldn't park on the street. Although there were ample spaces on the street, you couldn't tell them differently. So we decided to keep it open. Uh, the problem, the thing we're playing with though is we've got the stay at home orders in place. And uh, with that being said, how do you charge people for monthly parking if the city's telling people not to come to work? Right. Are others having that same problem? Yeah. So I have a question uh, for you and, and some others that I wanted to talk a little bit about. What are, you, what are you doing in social distancing within the facilities and how's that working out, especially if, if you started to return to work, uh, particularly break rooms, locker rooms, vehicles, uh, work sites? Um, do you find that people are pretty much doing what they should do? 
Do you have to have a proctor or somebody running around saying, okay, break up? Do you have to close things? What, what is everybody thinking about in that regard? Because it's something we've really been struggling with. For us, it's been working out fairly well. Uh, most of the employees are self-policing it themselves. We get staggered shifts, so the break room issue doesn't seem to be too much of an issue. Uh, we did get a call from the union, though, last week. One of the employees called the union and had a problem about uh, restroom, six foot distancing in the restroom. So we put a sign on the restroom door, one person at a time in the restroom. And that, since we did that, people have been going along with that, and that's been working out. But, you know, it's kind of petty to have to deal with those types of things that we have. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Interesting. I, had, I hadn't thought about one at a time. Uh, <laughs> That could be, I don't know how many bathrooms we, you know, separate facilities we have. That could be problematic here at the PPA, but we may have to face that. Put that down, Green, it's something to think about. Um, how about Orlando? We might as well go to the Disney of all Disneys. Pam, what's going on in Orlando and how are you dealing with uh, getting back to work? Well, actually, um, we have been fully staffed. We never okay. sent people home. Um, the word was is if you can work from home and you can work from home we had a lot of people that chose to take personal leave or no pay um so we did that um our enforcement staff has actually been working on the maintenance so we've actually been cleaning our individual meters and recleaning them and cleaning them and cleaning our garages and our facilities um our meters are still on on the street. Um, we're not enforcing anything except, of course, for safety, but most people are paying. So that's good. When people have called to complain, we've um, recommended our cell phone option. So um, as far as in the office, we've been trying to social distance and alternating with the people that can work at home versus staying in there. And like I said, for enforcement and maintenance with 10 facilities, people are pretty dispersed. But this has been going on since I think March 13th. And of course, everybody has gloves. Everybody has plenty of masks. Um, we're social distancing. Um, our maintenance crews have been going through the offices and everything and cleaning everything twice a day. So we're keeping everybody gainfully employed. A lot of it is cleaning, but one of the things that happened right in the middle of March, we massively ordered all of our masks. We ordered all the gloves, all the cleaning supplies. So we're, although now six weeks later, we're staying pretty, um, the stock is starting to run out. Like everybody else, the streets are fairly empty, um, but, most of the regular businesses, the attorneys firms and all of those, they're still working and pretty busy. We've not had a big downturn on our monthly parking, but we have had a big downturn on the transient part or the hourly parking. Um, and of course, Disney being closed and they're saying now they're not gonna open until June 1st or maybe later. That's had a huge impact on you know the whole area as well. And our revenues are down, our on-street revenues are down about 90%, and our garage revenues are down. If you take out monthly parking, the transient revenues are down about 80%. So it, we're taking a hard hit. So, But we had to keep everybody gainfully employed. That was one of the notes I had just put on there. I didn't know if every, um, some of the other areas sent people home and they were still being paid to um, be sent home. But nobody's complained about cleaning because everybody's gainfully employed. And given the central Florida area and how many people are out of work due to the tourism, they're just happy to be working. Yeah. So um, what are the locals saying, uh, if anything, about how quickly they think tourism, because you are a, a big source of tourism, uh, how quickly that comes back, uh, particularly the airport? Are, are you getting any read on what their projections are? No, we get uh, regular reports. Um, air travel into Orlando is down um, 97% compared. Yeah, no, that's huge, right? 97%, yeah. um, especially when you look at the volume. But it's uh, it's been running between 95 and 97% because they do it compared to the same day last year. Um, there's no real prediction on it. Um, it's actually going to depend on... The fact is, is when Universal and Disney and SeaWorld opens, 
that is going to drive everything. It's going to drive the air travel. It's going to drive the hotels. That'll drive everything. And so until they actually make a formal announcement, it's all up in the air. And the cruise terminals, because, you know, we have Port Canaveral as well. Sure, sure. So is the thought that once those open, that likely you'll just have this massive surge? Or do they think it'll be a slow ramp up? If they're saying uh, they're not really saying, but I personally think that it's just going to be a surge. I think that there is a big pent up level of energy and people are tired of being indoors or, you know, being, you know, stuck inside. But that's just me personally. I think it's going to come back full force. Yeah, me personally, too. I'm all I'm ready. I'm ready to get on a flight and come to uh, Orlando and put my Mickey ears on and run around like a little kid because I'm tired of this uh, self-quarantine stuff. So I, I think you're right. I think it could it could explode. Uh, maybe not international travel, but it, it's interesting. We, uh, we run, you know, an airport operation and the revenue projections they have for Philadelphia International are very, very low with a long ramp up. And I can only hope that they're wrong for all of our sake. So thank you uh, for those, those comments, Pam. Um, Louisville. Parts on her Tiffany, what's going on? Hey, Scott, before we go to Tiffany, yeah, um, Alex, sure. is, Alex wants to add a comment to the sure. conversation. Yeah, Alex, sure. go ahead. Oh, hi. Well, Pam pretty much covered it, but because we also have a big tourism, you know, it's, it's really what drives us, the, the real money. Um, and we have the port here. So, you know, the port is pretty much stopped, uh, you know, the seaport and the airport at that, for that matter. Um, but one of the things that we did take um, advantage of, and, and that happened after our conversation last week, Scott, where you brought up this whole phasing in of employees. And uh, to be honest with you, I, I don't think at that point I had even thought about the employees. I was so worried about the operation. Right. Because Florida is one of the places that we knew was going to open first. Sure. Um, and uh, so one of the things that we did ahead of time and anybody who's in their offices, I'm in my office because there's not a lot of people here at all. I mean, I'm, so I'm taking advantage of the time but the, the ability to take away cares from the break rooms and the board rooms and any, you know, we were able to take advantage of getting some plexiglass to add a division between, um, you know, we have an open floor plan. So in order for people to feel safe and to be able to come back, um, because we are paying our employees, so we want them to get back in, in, in here to work, um, but always, you know, with a face plan as we need them. Um, so we are taking advantage of that and getting stickers for the floors. I didn't even think about, you know, the pay stations that are in the garages to space people out. Um, we have done a big push for, uh, for to use the mobile payment app, but also a big push for customers not to come to our window and make payments. So during this time, we really pushed a, uh, through, to, through IT, an ability for people to make all payments and everything um, through, through um, our website. So, I mean, these are things to think about. And I think as we talk about them, I think we're gonna see a new, a new norm, a new normal. And I think that we need to think a little bit uh, proactively of maybe we skip a couple of steps that we, you know, sometimes the, the evolution of the way we do things, we may have to skip a, a couple of steps to, to get to a place where people are comfortable. Um, yeah. And I'll tell you this, I did do a, a deep cleaning um, in, uh, in our offices and in the vehicles in particular, but it is not, cheap it is expensive it's a company that's certified by the cdc so it's not like any company that now says that they could spray everything and i'll tell you it's very expensive um sure. and so I, I just want you all to keep that in mind that you know as much as you can do on your own with your staff i mean it will be a lot more economical i just needed to do it i mean I, I did not have all the time to think about bringing in staff doing the cleaning i just needed to get a company in here and and, and do it and so that's what we did yeah, so I'm glad you shared that, Alex, uh, because you you are right. We've been thinking a lot about those things, and um, the industry is very efficient. But the efficiencies we've usually developed are in large part because we put a lot of people in very small and tight spaces, and social distancing is the opposite of that. So um, while I'm prepared to understand that we're going to have uh, costs, as you described, both uh, out of pocket for cleaning and then internally for loss of productivity, um, it's, it's the reality of where we are because in the end, I think none of us want to get sick uh, and, and it's the right thing to do. But um, 
but how do you do it? And uh, for instance, a typical impound lot, you have a cashier that's maybe two or three feet from the next cashier. And so how are you going to protect them? Are you just going to have half the number of cashiers? And if that's the goal, then start thinking about how to ensure or encourage payments online and less transactions. We've got to become very innovative uh, in order to reduce those, those exposures. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, this is Richard. I have a question. Yeah. About this, all right. Yeah. Um, Alex, Miami, right? You're muted, Alex. Oh, sorry. Do I unmute? No, no, you're fine. Oh, you're good oh, yeah. now. Yeah. You mentioned that uh, you know it's a, a lot of a lot of parking revenues have gone down, which I understand. Um, but you said the port has pretty much stopped, and I'm thinking here, Miami um, is not the largest, but it's a pretty major seaport on the East Coast, and so we all know we're getting our packages and what have you. Um, because yeah, the freight is continuing to move. Um, and so you're saying the port, there are no ships that are coming in and unloading? And, or, is, is that what I understand? Yes. Um, so, you know, a, a big source of the problem here in Florida were, came in from the ships, the cruise ships. Um, and so they have been docked. Um, uh, it, they're not traveling out and they don't have enough people to get on them. Unlike planes that have established a way for people to sit and still there's some planes that are flying in and out, not even close to the amount that were, I could see leaving from the airport um, before the, 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 the ships are not doing that. And, and, and Pam, correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, even the Disney ships, they, they put them in their island, in their own private island. So yeah, the ships are not moving. Um, now that I understood, I, I figured the cruise ships obviously the cruise they were ships, the cruise a long time. I, I I thought you were talking also about the cargo ships that are coming in. No, no, okay. cargo ships are coming in and out, not at the volume that they used to though, hmm. not at the volume that they used huh. to. And we just had a conversation with the GMCVB about that, um, and not at the volume that they used to. And I and I bring that up because uh, as these trucks come in and 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 they load and unload a different facilities right there in the Miami area and other parts of Florida. Uh, and making deliveries, we still got, we still have, as everybody on the line knows, a pretty serious issue with respect to, to deliveries in, in, in parking. Although now, surprisingly enough, there's lots of places for trucks to park and make deliveries. But, um, but that's still an issue. So I didn't, I didn't know where that cargo ship would stop. Thank you very much, Alex. Okay, we have a little more time, so I thought we'd hear from Tiffany in Louisville. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, a, a lot of what we're dealing with is similar to what everyone has described today, in particular taking a lot of heat from the citizens regarding why we are still on the streets to begin with. They feel as if we should abandon and everyone was entitled to free parking. We have seen a great uptick in construction during this time. And therefore there have been a number of bag meters so that the contractors can have space to do what they need to do. And we're doing enforcement in that arena. We also are, have scaled back, no booting, and scale, allowed more time at the meters. And some of this has just been organic because we had 19 enforcement officers and that's down to four. And they have to cover, the, those four enforcement officers are now responsible for covering the 4,800 meters that we have out there. And just by nat natural um, process, there are less citations that are gonna be able to be um, issued. And then for monthlies, surprisingly, our monthly for April did tremendously well. I was very shocked. I thought that there would have been more people canceled than did. What um, some of my conversations that have gone back to some of the monthly parkers that were pitching a fit about why we were charging had to do with even though we have a stay at home order, it's not a shelter in place. And there are still lots of companies, not lots, but there are still companies that come to work or do some of the rotating that is going on. For us, we rotate. Some people are in the office while others are off, and then some work purely at home. 
And for those that are still coming into the office, whether it's one day a week or one hour a week, they're using their monthly parking then. We also have been contacted by some of our major employers to ask us to look at some out of the box thinking. And we had been doing this previously, but this has forced us to be more aggressive about how we can help those that are teleworking sometime of the, some portions of the week and coming to the office at other portions of, week, of the week so that they're not paying full monthly parking, which is totally understandable. So we're looking at a lot of usage base. And we had moved to that for our hotels and their valets and their self park to that we had a lot of agreements that were in place and they were based on making sure that the valets and the hotels could be profitable. So there were a lot of uh, reductions to their advantage, but now since COVID has taken place, even those reductions are not planned to their advantage. So they would be set up in a way that they would have to pay significantly more than what they were using. So we switched those and went to usage only agreements and most of them were very inclined to that. And then we've had some, been, I mean, some tenants that um, are utilizing leasing space within the garage that have asked for some relief. So it's been very different and I agree with everyone while we would have possibly thought because COVID came along, there'd be less work. I have found myself being much busier since COVID had came along. So um, it's been interesting. Oh, you can't hear me? I can hear me. Yeah. Okay. Um, there were a lot of questions as you were talking that I saw flying back and forth and they go by the screen so fast I can't read them. But it seems like a lot of folks are interested in what, uh, what others think about the disruption to office space and how that might impact both on street and off street. Do uh, you have any thoughts in that regard about based upon what you've seen so far? Absolutely. We have a major vendor here and even pre COVID they had approached us about doing some, um, they, they actually represent 25% of our revenue for monthly parking. They had approached us about doing more working from home prior to this happening. And they were just finding that they didn't need as much office space and that they could um, eliminate a lot of the monthly parking by having more people working from home or doing some, a, a hybrid of the two. And if, if this was something that they thought was possible pre-COVID, we are confident that they would have been able to um, satisfy that belief at this point. And we don't anticipate that everyone will return. Yeah. And even even once this is over, we're thinking that a lot of companies would have re will have realized, hey, th this has saved us money and parking and lease payments and utility, whatever that looks like, and that there's going to be a, a true paradigm switch and we have to be prepared for what that might look like. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm glad you said that. And, and even ourselves, mm -hmm. when we would have thought that working at home would be impossible. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem that impossible now. I think uh, in one of my director's meetings, I think it was even this morning, they announced it was the 39th day of this new reality. Who would have ever thought that an organization like ours could operate and continue to function in 39 days of you know working from home? Uh, I would have told you it was impossible. Well, uh, I think I the, the biggest thing is, I don't think we could as is but we're, we're dealing with the new normal. If, if we had the amount of, um, I heard someone mention earlier about the transit and the amount of events, which we had had a, a tremendous amount of activity through events and um, the hotel activity, conventions, et cetera, and that is gone. It, but if that was still in place working from home, I don't believe it's reasonable but by the activity being predominantly monthly, if at all, then it's made it more conducive for us to work from home. I am praying <laughs> that things get at least more closer to, to what our norm was, which would require us to be in the field and being able to assist customers or making sure that they can move in and out of the garages the way um, we would want them to expedite that. And you can't do that from home. So. Yeah. 
Yeah, so just, uh, you know, my own perspective with Philly, uh, I know all of you'd be surprised, but Philadelphia is well known for their lawyers. There's this term out there about a Philadelphia lawyer. We, we interpret it as a compliment, even though we know the rest of the country uh, doesn't view it that way. But uh, like the lo big law firms in Philadelphia, they can't get their files. They need to go in. Mm -hmm. And we're anticipating that when they come in, they're driving. They're used to taking public transit, but there's no way they're getting on the public transit for the short term. So I think for the short term, we're going to get slammed. The question's going to be, you know, what happens thereafter, as you're saying, as things kind of settle in and people say, well, maybe not everybody needs to be in every single day. Mm -hmm. uh, I know Brett Wood and Casey Jones are flinging emails back and forth and they have opinions all over the place. Uh, I, I think we'll just have to wait and see. Uh, I don't know if any of them want to join in and comment, but they certainly have uh, expressed their email opinions about what this future is going to look like. Are either of you two, Brad or Casey, brave enough to enter the, the foray publicly with your face posted? I, I don't know about brave enough, maybe stupid enough, but we, we can, <laughs> every, everybody's got opinions nowadays. Um, but, you know, it's interesting. I mean, Casey brings up a really good point about, you know, the $22,000 per worker, uh, work from home. It's going to be pretty appealing. And I think, I think some people are going to, you know, to Pam, Pam's point, you know, there are a lot of people that want to get out of their house and go back to work because we're all stir crazy. But we right. may find like a happy medium where we don't work in the office every day of the week. We work, you know, two days a week and, and we have collaborative space instead of, you know, everybody has a, a physical office and office space begins to look different and, and the demands with office, you know, changes start to look different as well. So, um, you know, I, I, the, the one point that I've been thinking about and, and talking to people about is if, if we move to that kind of middle ground area, the monthly parking model where we sold somebody a permit because they're coming in every day may change to a daily parking model. Um, and, and in the university world that I've worked in quite a bit, that, that daily parking model tends to make a lot more money per space than, uh, than the, the monthly parking model. So there may be some revenue recovery if we start seeing that shift in that direction. I'll shut up now. No, no, I, I'm fascinating. Casey, do you want to take the contrary position? No, no, not a contrary position. And, and I'd say, Scott, thanks very much for being a master at facilitating uh, a discussion like this. You know, I guess my my thinking right now is, you know, I think we're going to see some acute shortages in terms of parking supply in some uh, segments and areas and the reverse in others. You know, imagine a street that's really consumed by um, restaurants, for example, and um, if 50 percent of, you know, what we're doing now as far as getting dining out is takeout, um, you know, let's imagine all the TNCs, but now uh, you know, private vehicles wanting that same thing, that high turnover in spaces. Um, but I do think, you know, just to go back on the telecommuting conversation just slightly, you know, a lot of us um, really had never done that. And so, you know, we formed an opinion that it wasn't viable. And now we are forced to make um, it work as best we can. So, you know, I think this proof in what we're doing, um, not just there, but, you know, in all, all kinds of change that's in front of us now, is going to disrupt the conversation, you know, and so I think we are, you know, we've proven that we can do some things that we didn't think we could or didn't want to do before. That's not a all or nothing solution, uh, but it's definitely something we need to pay attention to and plan for. So I'll put you on the spot with a blind question. What do you think? Do you think there's some retreat from, say, large cities to more medium to smaller thinking that just less density, less potential exposure. I mean, we're dealing with COVID-19. What's it next year? Is it COVID-19.1 or, or COVID-20 or, so, or some other, you know, some other strain of virus? Yeah, I, you know, I think if you, you look at national uh, migration patterns before COVID-19, we were actually seeing that uh, push towards the West, push, push towards, you know, um, second tier cities, for example, people looking for a different quality of life. Um, and and COVID-19 and, you know, very densely populated places is just yet another, you know, yet another um, compelling reason for that. So I, I, I would imagine that trend to continue as people, um, you know, improve their sort of, you know, um, mobility options. Um, and maybe they're, you know, they're chasing 
employment like they didn't before. So that could push them into other, you know, that could accelerate that, that pattern that we've seen over the last, you know, five or 10 years. Yeah. I don't know. Does anybody else have a different opinion on that or a He's different not, opinion? Not. Oh. It's Rachel. I don't have a different opinion, but I've got a little bit of a, a different um, perspective on it. From the real estate perspective, what I'm seeing out of, you know, the ULI and all those REITs and those people who look at office space, frankly, most of our layouts are terribly wasteful. Um, they're old. They can't be updated easily. But what they're looking at doing is what some of the tech companies have done for a long time. You know, you enter the building, you either have a laptop or you have a plug-in or you have a login. You don't have a dedicated space. You don't have a dedicated office. It's not necessarily a small cubicle. There are co-working spaces, there are offices, but you aren't assigned to a space. Meaning the folks who come in either on a flexible schedule, depending on shift work, or come in, maybe they work three days at home and two days in or two days, whatever, those flexible arrangements, the assignment of the office to the human is outdated and will be a thing of the past. It's not just, you have to update real estate as it goes on. So the interior designers are looking at it, not just from a safety perspective now, but also as a sustainability initiative and um, a modern sort of releasing concept. Now, understanding we're not gonna go out and update all our parking you know, offices and operations, but you look at that when you look at leasing and bringing people back in. Do I have the most effective use of office space because because it does it costs quite a bit per square foot yeah yeah well and it's also what we've been longing for in part two right you always wanted to have the three day you know weekend if you will where one day's working at home the thing that messed all this up was they brought children into it made them stay home with us i'm kidding we love our children just not for 38 days in a row <laughs> right <laughs> yeah. um Scott, Dave Honorado wanted to say something. Sure. Oh, of course. How could we stop it? Well, well, it was all Dave. said. We're looking at the challenges when we roll out again. Again, our enforcement is completely suspended. We're in conversation with the city administration. It doesn't look like we'll be up on enforcement. All the parkers vacated the garage once they realized the streets were free. So it's a double whammy effect. But, uh, the challenge is looking forward. We try to take it a step forward too, and you, you'll get a kick out or relate to this one. I uh, reaching back out to the state to promote ticket by meal again, and we're going to sell it this time as uh, we'll be able to be in compliance with uh, the social distancing. We'll keep the officers from interacting with the public, touching vehicles. Therefore, they won't need to be out in the, the public with gloves and mask on. And also, we were uh, due for an upgrade at our meters uh, this year. And now we're rethinking it. Is there a possibility since we've been uh, eliminating cash transaction in a lot of places, do we want to go uh, cashless with the meters, this kind of upgrade uh, earlier than we anticipated? So that's things we're looking at too and evaluating as a result of this. Yeah, so I'm glad you brought that up, Dave. Uh, one of the things we need to do is take out that old wish list that we had of everything we wanted city council or our local municipality to approve uh, that we thought was good. Now's the time to dust it off and put it, put it to them in a new form and say, here's my wish list. Let's get these things done. And, and you're being very innovative with your message by saying, hey, I'm practicing social distancing. Uh, so it's a great idea. Now's the time to advocate for those things that we need and have wanted but just could never get over the finish line. I mean, we don't even try. We don't even charge in Philadelphia for truck loading zones. I don't mm -hmm. know. I don't know in what minority we're in, but we've got to be in a substantial minority. Now's the time to, you know, to stop making them free. Um, are we shocked that they come in and double park because everything's free and they'll just take the ticket? Um, if we charge them, maybe they'll be more socially responsible. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Good, good luck with that. Good. Good luck. <laughs> I, I I will I will say on on uh, on Rachel's comment about the um, office space and the whole new paradigm shift. People that park, a lot of times, like your Daves of the world that have their special parking for President so and so, that means our parking may well change uh, because you go to places and reserve for the vice president, reserve for the supervisor of such and such, all these different spaces that are dedicated for the staff that now may or may not be coming in on a five day week basis, maybe three days or whatever, 
that could shift things up more directly to for us in the parking industry. I don't know if anybody's thought about that, but I think that may be on the horizon. Yeah, that's well, a good point. We know, yeah, we know that dedicated spaces aren't the most efficient use of parking resources. Popular or unpopular, Dave's reserve spot out front, and of course, Dave, I'm kidding. Um, you know what I mean? Like more flexible arrangements allow for greater use of shared parking. The best space, the most efficient space is the one that is not constructed because you are sharing it. Some things will not change. Um, so, you know what I mean? Looking at those resources more carefully in the future, um, Airbnb, it's a sharing economy. That is, that is also, I think, not going to change. It may slow down and it may shift due to what we're going through now, but you shouldn't assume a one-to-one -one ratio, one human, one space. Yeah. And then short term, um, we're dealing with the reality that people don't want to take public transit. I mean, not to put you on the spot, Rachel, but when will you feel comfortable getting, uh, getting into uh, SEPTA and coming downtown? <laughs> you don't have to answer that. Um, I, I actually, I, I, would, I would go today if I had yeah. to. I would okay. prefer to drive. Right. <laughs> I would prefer right. to drive and I would, I would use pay myself. To, you know what I mean? Again, but I'm, I'm a parking professional. I've got all the apps on my phone, right? Um, <laughs> but I, but I, would, I would go. I mean, I think it just depends on your tolerance. And, and I, am, I am at the higher end of that, that tolerance. Yeah, yeah. Uh, whereas, so you know, a lot of people. Go ahead. Anthony, hey. good to see you. Anthony, did you want to join the conversation? Anthony, are you on? He may not be able to hear. Anthony, I meet your line. Yeah, how you doing? Good. I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Sorry about that. Yeah, you're good. No worries. We can hear you loud and clear. Okay. How's everybody doing? Pretty good. Okay. So, uh, sounds like, uh, in the great city of Newark, New Jersey, we're struggling like everybody else. Um, you know, if you think of Newark, you may think of uh, an outer borough of New Manhattan, New York, parts of Queens and Brooklyn, uh, downtown plus outside residential. One of our major sources of uh, revenue is our alternate side parking or street cleaning enforcement, which has been suspended since like March 16th. Um, meters are on and active, although the city has asked us not to enforce meters, um, you know, so we could, as an independent authority, buck that request and go out and do it anyway, but that would probably be political suicide for me. So I'm not willing to jump into those shark infested waters. Um, but our revenue is down 90%. And I'm saying that, you know, conservatively could be a few ticks higher. Um, but we hope that we're gonna get back to a minimum meter enforcement in the next week or two, but no later than May 15th, which is a date that our governor has set is like a, uh, a movement date. Uh, they're opening state and county parks again uh, Friday. And then by May 15th, there should be some movement. So hopefully we can begin meter enforcement because people think they own those meter spaces now. And I hear similar comments we had people you know a skeleton crew unfortunately we furloughed over half our staff um fortunately for them most of them are probably making more money on unemployment through the enhanced unemployment of the cares act so they're getting an additional six hundred dollars a week so i'm not sure if those people are going to even want to come back to work you know should we open up the faucet you know in a couple of weeks because that's good till the end of july but you know in either event um you know, it's rough going right now. I foresee, you know, uh, a need for an immediate meter rate increase, summons rate increase after this is over. City Council is probably going to push back on that. Um, we're in the, you know, in the midst of building our first municipally owned and operated five story, 520 uh, space parking deck and office space facility. Um, Fortunately, that as a municipal project was deemed essential construction, it wasn't stopped. So that was some saving grace, but you know, we got a lot going on and all of this is definitely the wrong time for it to happen. But we had implemented um, pay by app only in our, you know, Newark is a college town. We have Rutgers, New Jersey Institute of Technology, County College, 
Um, and in those areas, it was very, you know, the students were very receptive to pay by app only. So no meters, just pay by app. I think that's going to be the future largely is just pay by app. We're not spending money on meters. You don't have to maintain them. And, uh, you know, when we have proper signage our you know, we use park mobile, our park mobile usage, like quadrupled over the past, you know, since the beginning of the year. Um, so that's where we're at some in substance. Um, you know, we're all kind of in the same boat. Um, you know, we have a lot of office buildings and things that people will probably be working remotely, but I think the saving grace is when people do come back to work, it's going to be a lot of people driving and not taking mass transit. So they're going to need to park on the street. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you brought a lot of those things up because, um, you know, you talked about rate increases, which is something that's been in the back of my mind. Uh, we know the mayor's going to need money. I think right now, everybody's probably, if you're an elected official, you're a mayor, you're counting on the feds bailing you out or your state bailing you out. And I hate to be the voice of disappointment, but in Pennsylvania, when you hear that they're talking about, forget this fiscal year, next fiscal year, they're talking about maybe a $15 billion shortfall. So what kind of promise, you could get a promise and it's gonna be a blank empty check with nothing in it. Uh, so, you know, I think rate increases and then turning the meters back on is something that if we share information, maybe mayors will feel more comfortable. Oh, well, Newark's on board, why should Philadelphia be on board? You know, right now there's been a tendency, understandably, to think about the general public and their and the unemployment rates and whether they can afford to pay. Um, and we've often heard, well, the gas company has waived penalties and the water company waived penalties. And my response is, but they didn't give away free gas and they didn't give away free water. They waived the penalties. And so uh, I think somehow parking is viewed a little differently as though it's something that you could just give away for free for a period of time. And so you're raising val very valuable points that no, we need to f continue to fill those holes. Because I know six months from now, they're gonna forget. They're gonna say, why didn't you deliver the 42 million or whatever the number was the year prior? We're gonna say, you don't remember, you turned off the meters. That's what happened. Okay. You turned the faucet off. <laughs> you turned the faucet off. And whatever you do, don't don't go on a suicide mission. We don't want to see you taken out. No, I won't do that. No, don't do that. That's not good for you. Yeah. So does anybody else have a perspective on on the turning on of meters and the you know the loss of revenues and then also what what this new norm is going to look like? Carrie Red is up next. Carrie, go ahead. Okay. Carrie, you're unmuted. Go ahead. Um, we'll wait back for um, Carrie to come back, but Benito actually reached out on me on Messenger. So go ahead, Benito, go ahead and unmute your line. All right. Um, so I guess continuing the conversation about the meter rate hike, I, it's timely because uh, council just recently started asking us um, to start thinking about that as well. Um, I guess maybe much like everyone else thinking, we need to consider the shortfall implications. Does our meter revenue account for 10 to 12% of our contributions to our uh, public transportation system here in Metro DC? Um, and I think, you know, there's been, our council has been, um, I think of the appropriate term, um, they hasn't been as, um, quick to jump on expanding performance pricing in the district. And now they're asking us to explore expanding performance pricing district wide. They're trying to figure out, okay, if we start uh, regulating uh, pricing on the curve based on demand, because the other concern, and it was in my comments is uh, with this concern of people not, when we start to open up here in the district, which for us is gonna be closer towards the fall, according to the mayor, um, People are going to jump back in their cars, uh, and we already have the worst traffic in the country, uh, which then is going to it's going to slam our park, our curbside parking, and our uh, off street. Well, district doesn't manage off street, but still, I'm sure it's going to um, reverberate to our private sector partners there. Um, the question of we probably need to contemplate um, uh, performance pricing implications, and, and it's something I guess you know councils 
you know, seeing the tea leaves and asking us, look into it, let's make something happen because this is going to be something we need to address sooner than later. Thank you. Thank you, Benito. Um, it looks like we may have time for one or two more comments. Um, my guess, if you want to add some, add to the conversation. Uh, sure. Again, thanks for doing this uh, to everybody at IPMI and Scott. Thanks for hosting. Uh, this has been great. Um, on the same subject, we've been talking about what it means for us to bring back paid parking in Seattle. Um, we have a performance-based system where we try to achieve everybody's you know, magical occupancy target and adjust our rates annually accordingly. We turned paid parking off about a month ago, and when we come back at the end of the stay home order, uh, which is a sort of a moving target here in Washington, um, we assume we're going to start at 50 cents an hour everywhere, uh, recognizing there's going to be a transition period for businesses as they come back. And then it's sort of a, we get to put on our policy hats a little bit and figure out what the next step is. So we are going to be looking at transaction data sort of before this all happened and comparing it to, to transaction data as things come back online. Um, thinking about things like whether we need to relax time limits um, on the street and still allowed for paid parking and also thinking about things like we have active nightlife areas and our presumption is those are going to be some of the last things that get turned back on or places where large crowds gather um, and nightlife seems like one of those things. So will we treat sort of some of our historic nightlife areas in a different way if we're really sort of taking a performance based approach to what we're doing. That's good. Any any other comments? Scott, I did um, just want to offer one thing. And uh, Anthony, I uh, obviously it pains all of us, and I know everyone is is suffering difficulties determining about layoffs or furloughs or whatever you all are going through at any level. Um, so I put in the comments, but I absolutely want you to to hear me. <laughs> Um, we ha are offering transitional memberships to anybody who is temporarily or permanently, you know, seeking new employment, you know, in the field. So if you have a list of folks you would like to, to pass us or, you know, you want to share our information with them, connect them with us, there is nothing that we would like more than to keep them in the fold. We have free trainings, we have these resources, we have a resume um, exchange on forum. Um, so please, please, both Anthony and anybody else who's, you know what I mean, sort of listening, reach out to us and let us know how we can keep those people in the fold. Um, because this is a tremendous community. You all have certainly shown that today. It's no less than what I expected. Um, and uh, I just want to make sure that the folks hear that. Okay. Awesome. So we still have a few more minutes. If there, does anybody else want to add a, another comment or have a question for the group? Um, I'd actually like to add a comment. This is Pam. Can you hear me? Yep, sure. we're here, Pam. Okay. I meant to bring this up a while ago, much like what Alex is doing with the uh, free parking or welcome back to Miami. We have been working with our downtown development board. Um, they're actually called DTO, Downtown Orlando. And we're going to be offering three free sessions for parking on street. It's going to be through our park mobile app. We're going to have a special code. We don't know what it's going to be yet, but like welcome DTO, but you know, downtown to provide two free hours. And then they're also going to be providing um, three hour validation stickers that they're going to be giving out to all the small businesses and, and everything to get people back downtown and they were paying for like the downtown development board is paying for like 90 percent of that so the rev we will be getting the revenue so we're only picking up about 10 percent of that bill so we've already started um working with um them to make that happen so i don't know how many people have or organizations have reached out to their partners and uh other organizations or their downtown development board or their equivalent downtown but we've already started having those conversations so that once things start opening back up we'll be able to immediately pull the trigger and implement those so i've learned a lot today i don't know if if you folks have um it's amazing how much we can learn from each other. So I want to thank everybody for, you know, participating and, and giving me some good ideas. Now I get to go home, 
have a nice glass of wine with a nice meal and think about everything everybody said and start working on uh, the positives of where we're going. And can the I positives. Jump in real quick? Yeah, sure. Uh, and Brett can jump in with me as well. Um, so, Brett, myself, and uh, working with uh, Institute of Transportation Engineers, uh, I think it's Complete Streets Council, Transportation for America, and we're trying to work with uh, NACDO, ENO, Transportation Center, and other organizations, maybe ULI as well. Uh, we're trying to bring together as much uh, information as we can on curbside management and COVID-19. Um, you may have seen in the IPMI um, blog today, uh, our first of what will be uh, a series of blogs about uh, curbside management, you know, first bringing the topic together, then talking about curbside management from a municipal perspective, private sector perspective, academia, because we're all a village as an industry uh, and how we can engage our various partners in these arenas to work together. Uh, you know, we don't work alone. So that's the initial blog series. Then the next step, maybe this summer, and hopefully can, you know, through case studies from everyone on this call participate um, to talk about various topics, whether, you know, implications of revenue, uh, you know, what um, uh, managing contactless parking, among other issues uh, of concern, to build up the research case, case studies, uh, to then lead on to the final stage uh, later in the fall, probably a, a you know, peer reviewed research that we can probably put together into the uh, for me, the Transportation Research Board. Um, so there, uh, you know, we try to document the knowledge base for not only us as professionals, but for future professionals in the industry. Because I would like to say this is not the last, I would like to say this is the last pandemic we'll ever have, but uh, I'll be fooling myself to think that. So it'd be good to be like, what did we do last time? be able to go back and say, oh, well, we know there's going to have these fiscal implications, staffing implications. So uh, if there's anyone that wants to participate in, you know, in that uh, research or help document the case, welcome it. Brett and myself, I was here in this chat and um, leading it with IPMI with these other partners and encourage you to um, socialize that conversation throughout your networks uh, in the various organizations you're a part of. Thank you. Yeah, I, just to tack on to that, and Benito is is doing a fantastic job of of connecting us with folks throughout the industry, and not just IPMI, but transportation mobility professionals. And um, if you've got stories, I've been I've been feverishly writing notes today about kind of what y'all are doing um, from a municipal standpoint. We're trying to capture as much of that as we can. And I think the important thing is we're taking that beyond just IPMI's borders to Transportation for America, Smart Cities Collaborative. Um, ITE, all of these groups, just so that they understand the impact of parking um, that we've had on, 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 the, on the pandemic and that it's having on us and we can all kind of work collaboratively. So um, if, you, if you find interesting information, please pass it on to Benito and I and we're trying to compile it and get it out there for the world to see. So thank you all very much. Thank you. We have one last comment from Carrie. Go ahead, Carrie, you're unmuted. Carrie, you there? All right. Okay. I think Sean, were you going? Can we unmute Sean if he's muted? I guess that's the whistle. There you we're, are. We're done. We're done. I wanted to just thank Scott for all your help. Uh, you're you're terrific, Scott. Thank you. And Finito, uh, the things that you're talking about especially with uh, curbside management. We've been doing so much work there. It only makes sense for us all to collaborate. Why should anybody or one organization do it alone? So that makes perfect sense. I heard the other day that, you know, people talk about we look forward to the new normal. And I heard yesterday that uh, people are looking forward to, forward to the new unnormal. And I'm not even sure what that even means. But it sounds different from what we're doing now. So it sounds, uh, sounds appealing. But I, I think especially for these kind of conversations, that one, that we, uh, we are all in this together. I think we do learn from each other. The, uh, the scope of it is, is that, especially for an organization like IPMI, where we have so many diverse uh, people and opinions, that the more we share, I think you'll get some nugget out of it. 
So I appreciate everybody's time today. And you know, from the, uh, the standpoint of, of the conversation, I hope you'll continue to use the forum. Our uh, online chat is getting lots and lots of activity and people just sharing lots of things that they're dealing with and, and looking for some uh, solutions and seeking some answers. So it's another way to continue this conversation, but thanks to everybody for all your time today. Thank you. All right, and with that, um, we're gonna have to end up wrapping up here. Um, I wanna thank everyone who participated and a special thank you to Scott for moderating the discussion. Um, this will conclude today's shop talk. I invite everyone to continue the conversation in IPMI's forum at forum.parking-mobility.org and then join us again for our next two shop talks on May 6th and May 13th for our uh, for the um, for the next programs. Um, I also wanted to invite everyone to stay connected. Um, please visit the Stay Connected page. Our community has a long history of being resourceful and helpful during both difficult times. Thank you for your membership, your support, and your willingness to jump in and connect and your dedication to our industry. Um, lastly, I wanna invite everyone to join us for our IPMI uh, 2020 Virtual Parking and Mobility Conference and Expo. I know that we're not gonna be able to meet in person, but we'll be able to meet virtually together. Um, it will be packed with more than 40 sessions and 100 speakers diving deep into exploring key topics and opportunities to engage and foster collaboration and build lasting relationships. Um, we're going to feature access to all education platforms, both live and recorded for an entire year, general session and game changers that address the industry's most relevant topics, networking and collaboration with parking, transportation and mobility professionals from around the world, technology focused labs, um, the largest showcase of in innovative technology and services looking for looking to streamline your operations. Let us know if you have any questions. We'll be, we will see you there. So with that being said, um, thank you for joining us today. Um, today's shop talk is copyrighted in 2020 by the International Parking and Mobility Institute with all rights reserved. You may now disconnect. Thank you. <laughs>